Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this video, I'm going to be discussing non-malignant granulocyte and monocyte disorders. All right, let's get started. This lecture video is, of course, on non-malignant granulocyte and monocyte disorders. Uh, so these are uh, benign changes of the granulocyte white blood cells, so neutrophils, eosinophils, and basophils, and of monocytes in response to a non-malignant disease like a virus or infection. And when I say the term non-malignant, I mean non-cancerous, so benign. Um, these are normal responses um, to the issue. Uh, usually in a non-malignant infection or virus, one cell type is going to respond, and that can give us a clue to the patient's disease state. So, for example, uh, when a patient has an increase of neutrophil, um, it is referred to as neutrophilia. And this usually indicates that the patient is fighting a bacterial infection. Uh, when a patient has an increase of lymphocytes, it's referred to as lymphocytosis and usually indicates that the patient is fighting a viral infection. When there is an increase of eosinophils, it is called eosinophilia and usually indicates a parasitic infection or allergy. The normal leukocyte or white blood cell count is around 4 to 11 times 10 to the 9th power per liter in an adult patient. When the white blood cell count is higher than 11 times 10 to the 9th power per liter, this is called leukocytosis. Now these values are normal in infants from newborn to 6 months of age. Their white cell count can be as high as 30 times 10 to the 9th power per liter and still be considered normal. I think way back to when I gave my leukocyte lecture and we were discussing relative and absolute counts. When we are doing a differential, we count and differentiate the white blood cells out of 100. So for example, like I'm just making this up here, let's say we counted 85 neutrophils, 12 lymphocytes, and three monocytes on our differential. Those would be their relative counts. Now the absolute white blood cell count takes into account the patient's white blood cell count. So let's say that this particular patient in this example uh, their white blood cell count was 5 times 10 to the 9th power per liter. So to get the absolute count, you would multiply 0.85 by 5. So the 0.85 is the relative count, and then the 5 is the total white blood cell count. And this would be 4.25. So this would be the absolute count of neutrophils. For lymphocytes, uh, for this patient, you would take 0.12, which is the relative count, and multiply it by 5, which is the total white blood cell count, and that answer would be 0 0.6. So that's the absolute count. Um, so you get the picture of how this is done. Um, absolute white cell counts are important for the physician to determine actual increases or decreases of cell types. Neutrophilia is defined as a neutrophil absolute count of greater than 7 times 10 to the 9th power per liter in an adult patient. Segmented neutrophils or banded neutrophils will be 80% or higher. Uh, there's usually uh, something we call a left shift, which is an increase of immature granulocytes uh, within the bloodstream. So you'll see banded neutrophils, metamyelocytes, uh, myelocytes, and promyelocytes. Uh, blast can be in left shifts, but not when associated with a non-malignancy. Um, I did make a video just uh, talking about what left, sh left shifts are in detail, uh, so please check that video out. Neutrophilia is most common in bacterial infections, uh, but can occur uh, with general inflammation and destruction of tissues. Uh, there are a couple of conditions like leukomoid reaction, leukoerythroblastic reaction, and physiological leukocytosis that are associated with neutrophilia as well, and we will discuss those on the coming slides. So when a patient has neutrophilia, oftentimes the neutrophils will undergo toxic changes, and we can actually see these changes while performing a manual cell differential on these patients. 
So these changes are toxic granulation, dole bodies, and vacuoles. So toxic granulation is when there are large purple granules in the cytoplasm of segmented neutrophils. So this cell here, this segmented neutrophil, is showing toxic granulation. So you see all those larger purple granules present in the cytoplasm, right? So that's toxic granulation. Now, dole bodies are light gray to blue inclusions within the cytoplasm of neutrophils. So this cell here is showing a dole body. So you can tell this is a segmented neutrophil. And you see this kind of lightish blue inclusion on that neutrophil. This is a dole body. All right. And then vacuoles. So this uh, neutrophil is showing vacuolization. So these happen, these vacuoles actually happen most often just naturally in monocytes, uh, but they can happen in neutrophils when there are toxic changes happening. Um, so in neutrophilia, if you see um, these toxic changes happen, they usually kind of happen all together. Uh, most commonly dole bodies and um, this toxic granulation, uh, but frequently there, there will be vacuoles as well. So this is very common in neutrophilia. A leukemoid reaction is an increase of white blood cell um, that mimics cancer, most commonly chronic myelogenous leukemia or CML. There are a lot of circulating immature neutrophil precursors in the blood and chromosome studies are performed to differentiate it from cancer. Um, so this is caused by very severe infections or necrotizing tissues within the body. Uh, it's just a very extreme neutrophilic reaction, but it is benign, meaning it's non-cancerous. It just looks like cancer, it's just not. <laughs> a leukoerythroblastic reaction is when the patient has a left shift in their peripheral blood along with nucleated red blood cells. So they may also have poikilocytosis, which is a variety of different shapes of red blood cells uh, present in the peripheral bloodstream. Leukoerythroblastic reactions occur most commonly in patients with chronic uh, myeloproliferative disorders uh, like myelofibrosis. So myelofibrosis is a cancer of the bone marrow um, that basically causes the bone marrow to be replaced with a very fibrous scar tissue. Uh, so patients with that can get leukoerythroblastic reactions and also those patients that have severe hemolytic anemias. Physiological leukocytosis is when the body has an increased white blood cell count with an elevated neutrophil count in response to physiological stressors. So this can be in response to an exposure to extreme temperatures, extreme emotional stimulus, uh, a, a very rigorous exercise, and also uh, labor and delivery in a pregnant patient. Uh, this can also occur with newborns, so for the first few days of their life. So an increase of white blood cells, lots of neutrophils, um, but this usually does not have a shift to the left, just an increase of those white blood cells. Anytime intracellular organisms or any organism in the peripheral blood smear uh, is seen, it's always significant. A bacteria or yeast can be present in the bloodstream and you can see it while doing a manual differential. The picture on the right hand side of the screen uh, shows bacteria present in the blood. So it's these little purple things that are all over. There's one that's just on the red cell. All of those are bacteria that are in uh, this person's blood. Um, so <clears throat> note that this is with a right Giemes stain. Uh, which is a stain that's used to do manual differentials in hematology. Uh, this is not a gram stain, uh, which is done in microbiology. So you'll not be able to determine if a bacteria is gram negative or gram positive in a blood smear like this, only uh, that there are bacteria present in it. Ehrlichia is a type of bacteria uh, that causes a significant tick-borne infection. Uh, patients will experience fever, chills, muscle aches, nausea, kind of flu-like symptoms when infected with this. Uh, they'll also have leukopenia, which is a decrease in white blood cells, and thrombocytopenia, which is a decrease of platelet levels. Uh, the patients may um, also have elevations in their liver enzymes. So the right-hand side of this slide uh, here shows Arlichia in a peripheral blood smear uh, shown in uh, the neutrophil. Um, so here, obviously, 
here. All right. Um, so the antibiotic doxycycline is the recommended treatment uh, for this uh, infection. Older Riley anomaly is an inherited abnormality of the white blood cells that is commonly associated with mucopolysaccharidosis. Um, and mucopolysaccharidosis is a type of metabolic disorder uh, that is part of the lysosomal storage disease family. I discussed this disorder in my clinical chemistry lectures in more detail, uh, but this anomaly uh, causes large purplish granules in the cytoplasm of all the white blood cell types. Now, it doesn't affect the cells in any way. Uh, they're functionally normal. It just makes them look weird with these uh, large purplish granules. Pilger-Hewitt anomaly is an inherited condition where the neutrophils and eosinophils in the peripheral bloodstream fail to progress beyond the band stage. So a picture of this and a neutrophil is on the right hand side here. Uh, so there's hyposegmentation of the nucleus, almost looks like a pair of glasses. Um, so these cells are functionally normal, uh, they're benign, uh, they just look kind of odd. Chidiac Higashi syndrome is a rare autosomal recessive disorder. This disease damages the immune system, leaving the white blood cells um, just with the ability to phagocytize the foreign invaders, but not kill them. Um, so they don't work properly. They eat them, but they don't destroy them. So you'll see giant fused granules and neutrophils and lymphocytes in patients with this disorder. Uh, patients with Chidiac Higashi syndrome have frequent infections throughout their life. May-Heglin anomaly is a rare autosomal dominant disorder that is characterized by decreased platelets and uh, giant misshapen platelets. And granulocytes in this disorder uh, contain blue cytoplasmic inclusions uh, that look like dole bodies. So I discuss lipid storage disorders a lot in my clinical chemistry lecture series, but figure they were worth mentioning in this lecture as well. So there are two that we're going to be discussing briefly, a Gaucher's disease and neiman pick disease. So Gaucher's is caused from a deficiency of glucose rebrosidase. Patients with this have a buildup of fat in the spleen and liver, and patients with Gaucher's disease have distinctive macrophages. Uh, the cytoplasm looks like large crumpled up paper. Now, I cannot find a copyright free image of Gaucher's cells, uh, so please go Google them, look them up to see what these cells look like. Um, and if anyone happens to have a copyright free image of this, please hit me up. I want to use it for this presentation. Uh, neiman pick disease is a metabolic disorder that results in an abnormal amounts of lipids in organs like the brain, spleen, and liver. Um, it's caused by a deficiency of sphingomyelinase, uh, resulting in macrophages that are foamy in appearance. And I do actually have a copyright free uh, picture of Neiman Pick macrophages. Um, so these are these foamy macrophages of a patient with Neiman Pick. Uh, so this is what they look like. And again, I talk about both of these lipid storage disorders in greater detail in my clinical chemistry lecture series. All right, so that's it for this presentation. If this video helped you out, go ahead and give it a like. And please make sure to subscribe to my channel for more educational laboratory content. And as always, if you have any questions about this lecture, feel free to leave them in the comments below. I will be happy to answer your questions. Okay, until next time.